Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. Welcome back. Today, we continue our exploration of the classic literary masterpiece, Don Quixote in its second half. In the previous installment, we summarized the content of the first part of Don Quixote. In this first part, the character of Don Quixote is tossed around like a delirious dog, and readers cannot see any damage to his self-esteem or health. We must admit that a significant part of the comedic enjoyment derived from this book comes from Schadenfreude. We realize ourselves as better readers who don't take the content of chivalric novels seriously, thus creating a dual sense of superiority over Don Quixote in both physical and intellectual aspects. The book achieved tremendous success upon its initial publication, likely owing to this aspect. After gaining literary acclaim, Cervantes moved to Madrid, settling down and starting to work on other pieces, but none could compare to the success of Don Quixote. It is unclear whether he entertained thoughts of revising the first part of the novel, but he always struggled with a lack of time. His expectations for this work were so high that he disdained creating a sequel quickly just to capitalize on its popularity. What we will discuss today is the second part of the book. You will hear about Don Quixote's subsequent adventures, how his enemies transition from the capricious world to intentional ordinary people, and whether Sancho can successfully fulfill his role as an island governor. Most importantly, you will understand what makes this famous book truly great. In 1613, eight years after the first part was published, Cervantes announced his plans to publish the second part of Don Quixote. However, in 1614, there were numerous fake books circulating, which angered him. This even led to modifications in his original writing plans. Looking back at Don Quixote's adventures in the first part, we see that although his goal is the entire world, in reality, he hasn't even reached another city. The whole book's narrative is quite loose, and shortly after the first part's publication, abridged versions cutting side plots and leaving only the main storyline appeared. When Cervantes wrote the second part, he was evidently aware of this issue. He gave his characters clear objectives, making his protagonist head toward Saragossa to participate in a grand festival rumored to be held there. As mentioned earlier, Don Quixote's hometown is in the central region of Spain, while Saragossa is in the northeast. So, despite Spain not being a very large country, for our protagonist, this is still a quite distant adventure. However, before embarking on this long journey, we first need Don Quixote to complete the unfinished business from the first part, meeting his beloved Dulcinea. After all, she has been mentioned from the beginning of the story, and in almost 500 pages of the first part, she has yet to make an appearance. In the second part of the novel, Don Quixote's fate is largely freed from the elements of farce, and his new adventure is initiated by the provocation of others. From the second half of the first part, those familiar with him began to entertain thoughts of teasing him and making him go mad. In other words, his actions are no longer arbitrary or incidental, they are manipulated. Consequently, the vast world he faces is maximally reduced to just a few people around him, Padre, the barber, and a new character, Bachelor Carrasco. They visit the convalescent Don Quixote, and in their conversation they find that their old friend is still infatuated with that magical imaginary world. Unlike the housekeeper, they believe forcibly detaining Don Quixote is not the best solution. Instead, they think it's better to dispel his illusions through adventure. Their attitude toward Don Quixote aligns more with us readers. On one hand, they feel sorry for him as he continuously hits walls, and on the other hand, they find his nonsensical talk entertaining. The story continues, and our protagonist is now on the road to meet his beloved. Soon, he arrives in that town. By this time, Sancho already knows that Don Quixote is indeed mad, so he has no intention of actually finding Dulcinea, even if he could recognize her. Conveniently, three peasant girls on donkeys approach them. Sancho tells his master that these are the noble lady and her two attendants. Here, we witness Sancho perform an act of misdirection, while Don Quixote, who frequently experiences illusions, can see quite clearly that the women approaching have round faces flat noses, and a strong smell of garlic, they are certainly not his beloved. Sancho has learned the tricks of a magician and confidently asserts that Don Quixote has fallen under a spell. To him, 
even the most beautiful woman would appear ugly. From Don Quixote's perspective, the entire second part of the novel is his march toward Saragossa, simultaneously a process of lifting the curse imposed by the sorcerer. However, for everyone else, including Sancho, everything that happens is nothing but one lie after another, all serving a single purpose, to deceive this unfortunate man and enjoy the spectacle of his follies under the guise of goodwill. At this point, Sancho, for the most part, is intellectually on par with his master, and one might even suspect that Cervantes is speaking through Sancho's mouth. Sancho is aware enough to quote metaphors from the Rebaiyat, a collection of poems created by the Persian poet Khayyam in the 12th century. This book was translated into English only in 1859, making it highly unlikely that a peasant like Sancho would have read it. Let's take a look at the lines Sancho quotes. Helpless as pieces on a chessboard, day after day we move and are moved. Killing and stabbing as we come and go, the game ends, and each is placed in a box. This verse reflects the inevitability of death for everyone, regardless of their identity or social status. Next, Bachelor Carrasco, who came to visit Don Quixote with the priest and the barber, makes an appearance. Disguised as a wandering knight, he ingratiates himself with Don Quixote, intending to bet that if he defeats Don Quixote in a duel, the latter must return home and never speak of being a knight again. This was a plot set from the beginning of the book. We can observe that Don Quixote's friends are not considering things from his perspective. In fact, they are somewhat cruel, waiting for him to be defeated in battle and thus forcing him to yield. However, this surrender occurs within the framework of chivalric novels, as part of Don Quixote's imagined knightly life. Therefore, even if he undergoes much torment, he cannot fully awaken but can only feel pain and reluctance. Despite the more than twenty-year age difference between the duelists, Don Quixote is fated not to return home. Unexpectedly, Carrasco's horse disobeys commands, resulting in Carrasco being knocked to the ground. This greatly boosts Don Quixote's confidence, and the plan to deceive him into returning home reaches a temporary conclusion here. Although significantly restrained in the second part, Cervantes still arranges a few harmless adventures, such as mistaking a windmill for a prison and taking puppets for real people. Don Quixote even wants to engage in combat with a lion in a cage along the way, but the lion is too lazy to pay him any attention. Of course, there's another inserted love story. This unpolished narrative seems to be a response to certain aspects of the first part of the novel. We should focus on chapter 30 and beyond, where the master and servant finally encounter the big boss of the story, the cruelest character in the entire novel, the Duchess. She has read the first part of the novel and knows who Don Quixote is. We can interpret the author's intention in the following way. Ten years after the novel's publication, Don Quixote is famous enough, and the distance between the fictional character and the real person has diminished. It's no longer Don Quixote venturing into the world, but this cruel world recognizing him, gathering around him with malicious intent. This suspicion is hard to avoid even for readers who laughed heartily when reading the first part. At the moment of their meeting, the Duchess is out hunting, dressed like a beautiful huntress, and this wandering knight is her most interesting prey. The Duchess invites them to her castle, marking the first time Don Quixote and Sancho truly enter the interior of a castle. We can see that in the second part of the novel, Don Quixote's encounters with randomness significantly decrease, and his adventures are more within a certain framework. From a macro perspective, the capricious world won't pose fatal dangers to him. Instead, the danger mostly comes from certain people's carefully orchestrated schemes. While reading, it might seem that Don Quixote's fate has stabilized compared to the first part, but in reality, the cruelty of the book has not diminished in the slightest. The Duke and Duchess are conscious readers of chivalric novels. Regardless of Don Quixote's requests, they fulfill them all to lull him into the belief that he is indeed a knight. Following this is the elaborate trap they've arranged. In reality, they are the illusionists creating illusions, only this magic is realized with real people. This time, our Don Quixote has truly fallen into the hands of the illusionists. One night, they deceived Don Quixote into the woods and set up a grand spectacle. Her servants disguised themselves as six sorcerers, and one made claims to be the cursed Dulcinea. 
The simple method to lift the curse is to make Sancho take off his pants and endure three thousand lashes. Sancho, however, doesn't buy into the chivalric novel plot and vehemently resists, temporarily putting an end to this crude and brutal joke. Continuing, a person claiming to be the distressed Anna appears, hoping they will blindfold themselves and ride flying horses to rescue a pair of lovers in a distant land. Needless to say, the flying horse is another Trojan horse prepared by the Duke and Duchess. In reality, Don Quixote and Sancho sit motionless on the horse, while several large fans blow, creating the illusion of flying through the clouds. Someone even uses a pole to waft burning plants to smoke their faces. The Duke and Duchess, along with their servants, eavesdrop on Don Quixote and Sancho's conversation inside the drum, deriving immense pleasure from the spectacle. As the climax of this farce, the servants eventually detonate firecrackers inside the Trojan horse, sending both of them tumbling. Next, there are pranks specifically targeted at Sancho, such as pretending to grant him an island and then staging an invasion, forcing him to leave. Surprisingly, while managing the island, Sancho doesn't create as many jokes as the Duchess anticipated. Instead, he displays outstanding leadership and noble qualities surprising those who attempted to mock him. This is the wisdom hidden within common sense. During Sancho's absence, the Duchess arranges for a maid to sing serenades under Don Quixote's window, revealing a rare moment of weakness and vacillation in our protagonist. Faced with an offered romantic encounter, he seems discontented and abruptly closes the window, as if encountering some unfortunate event. The content related to the Duke and Duchess spans a full thirty chapters of the novel, accounting for nearly a quarter of the entire book. Later, Don Quixote decides to continue his adventures, leaving the cruel couple behind. Dissatisfied, they arrange for people to pretend as bandits and capture Don Quixote, organizing a grand magical ceremony. Fortunately, Sancho maintains an instinctive resistance to these tricks throughout, letting others speak dismissively of him. It's because of his non-compliance that the Duke and Duchess's plot of first hypnotizing and then tormenting him never succeeds. Cervantes vividly describes the scenes arranged by the Duke and Duchess, but the methods they use to torture Sancho are fundamentally not much different from schoolyard bullying. Of course, Don Quixote is persuaded by the Duke and Duchess. He believes that to lift Dulcinea's curse, Sancho must endure three thousand lashes. Whether these lashes were successful remains a suspense that lasts until the end of the novel. During an argument, Don Quixote attempts to use force, but Sancho easily pins him to the ground, proving that our protagonist lacks any real martial skills. Luck does not favor him once again. Remember the false knight who intended to defeat Don Quixote and force him to return home? He returns in different attire, flipping Don Quixote to the ground and compelling him to surrender forcing him onto the road back home. At this point, near the end of the entire book, it seems that both Don Quixote and the author are tired. The surrender occurs so quickly and unexpectedly, leaving readers in bewilderment. As for the remaining contradiction, the three thousand lashes, Sancho resolves it in a sorcerer's way. He runs into the woods, pretending to moan in pain while whipping a tree all night. From then on, Don Quixote never encounters any castles or sorcerers again. He smoothly returns home, falls ill, and remains bedridden in for six days. In his dying moments, he realizes the absurdity of his actions. The false knight who once knocked him to the ground, Bachelor Carrasco, writes an epitaph for him. He never regarded anyone, he once made the world tremble in astonishment. His fate turned out to be so capricious. While he lived, he was always mad. At the moment of death, he was clear-headed. We see that when Don Quixote realizes he has lifted Dulcinea's curse, he also dispels the magic on himself. There is no longer any force compelling him forward. This is a literary death. In pathological terms, he may have died from uremia, as the book mentions he had kidney disease, and the housekeeper once claimed to have used over 600 eggs to tend to his injuries. A person with kidney disease should not be consuming so many eggs. Finally, we have completed the journey through Don Quixote's life. Perhaps you are not aware that Cervantes died of diabetes in his later years, indicating he likely had a decent diet in his old age. However, 
he did not have the chance to enjoy the fame brought by this masterpiece. One year after the publication of the second part of the novel, he passed away. As we mentioned earlier, Don Quixote and two of Shakespeare's four major tragedies, Macbeth and King Lear, were almost written simultaneously. What's even more remarkable is that Cervantes and Shakespeare both died on the same day. Praises for Cervantes are numerous, coming from figures such as Dickens, Tolstoy, Goethe, Kundera, and even Marx. Marx stated that Cervantes and Balzac surpassed all other novelists, and writers unanimously considered Don Quixote as the first modern novel in European literary history. This assertion isn't merely because Cervantes constructed his novel on outdated and vulgar chivalric tales, eventually eradicating them. In fact, chivalric literature was never eradicated. Its various forms have persisted to this day. What truly matters is that Don Quixote is a genuinely complex and profoundly literary novel, deserving of repeated readings and contemplation. One can even discern the shadow of Plato's Republic within it. Plato was anti-art, and naturally, anti-novel because he believed that artistic works were irrelevant to truth, merely descriptive, and inclined to cultivate the inferior and irrational aspects of human nature. This sentiment aligns perfectly with the views of the priest, the barber, and many others in the novel. When facing Don Quixote's fantasies, they consider themselves embodiments of reason, making them appear exceedingly cruel. So, the question we must ask ourselves is whether we align with Plato. Is the laughable Don Quixote genuinely laughable? This may bewilder us because cruel laughter will eventually fade, and as we read, our sympathy gradually prevails. We do not know if Don Quixote should return to his hometown because we already know that once he returns, his dreams will wither, and he will face death. If a person is already on the brink of death, what use is the so-called clarity? Readers revisiting this book, including literary experts, generally fall into two camps, the Don Quixote camp and the Sancho camp. Don Quixote adherents believe that he is the most remarkable romantic, the bravest individual, the enemy of all that is dull. In a coarse and unromantic world, individuals like him inevitably become mentally unstable. On the other hand, Sancho adherents, do not be mistaken, view Sancho not as the stereotypical fool. Initially, faced with Don Quixote's noble madness, Sancho exhibits a lower form of foolishness. However, as the story progresses, we realize that, in fact, Sancho respects common sense more and understands his boundaries. We must also mention Gustave Flaubert's timeless work Madame Bovary, where Emma Bovary becomes a victim of romantic novels and eventually meets a tragic fate due to her fanciful imagination. This is a distorted version of Don Quixote. Flaubert leans more towards the Sancho camp. His attitude towards Madame Bovary is more critical than sympathetic, believing her passion to be foolish, blind, and completely divorced from reality. Sancho can also be seen as a variation of Don Quixote's character. In the first half of the book, Sancho represents the relatively uninteresting aspect of Don Quixote's personality, embodying his daily life before the impromptu decision to embark on an adventure. Towards the end, Sancho's dreams even become a reality, transitioning from a squire to a governor. This seemingly unattainable dream supports him as he ventures to the end of his adventures. Meanwhile, Don Quixote gradually falls from the dream world to reality, suddenly becoming devoid of initiative. The final chapter of the entire book does not provide a spectacular ending but rather reaches a conclusion we have long been aware of. This conclusion has been repeatedly delayed, as if the entire narrative process was designed to create this prolonged delay. It is indeed disheartening. Don Quixote's remorse leads him back to the real world, and this, in turn, becomes akin to a surrender. The ultimate failure is not death but enlightenment. Enlightenment implies bidding farewell to fiction. In the last three days of Don Quixote's life, the entire household is in chaos, yet the housekeeper still drinks, and Sancho remains as cheerful as ever because he finally receives the promised payment. Harold Bloom, an American literary critic, stated that this book is permeated with an air of nihilism. This nihilism is reflected in the fact that, despite Don Quixote's bravery and nobility, always aspiring to chivalrous deeds, he ends up being the source of laughter. 
An ordinary person sacrifices their life to provide the world with a tragedy, yet the world does not need it. Let's return to the question of how to conclude the story of Don Quixote. Readers from both camps will have their own conclusions, and neither can triumph over the other. This is because we cannot reduce his fate to a moral question of good or bad, nor should we perceive him solely as a madman who cannot distinguish between fiction and reality. In fact, he raises many questions that were difficult for people of his time to comprehend and are still worth pondering today. Questions such as, what is the self? What is reality? What is love? In this book, Cervantes touches upon the boundaries of these concepts, allowing us to discover that taking one more step forward may lead us out of the comfort zone and into an entirely new and unfamiliar territory. There, things that seem commonplace in everyday life may face unabashed ridicule. Over 400 years have passed, and the literary figure of Don Quixote has not faded in the slightest. Instead, with the passage of time, it has grown into different transformations. Works like Dickens' The Pickwick Papers and Flaubert's Madame Bovary have been influenced by him. The reason this book still holds such a revered position today is because the character of Don Quixote can adapt to various forms and cultures of human society. Regardless of your country of origin, you can see a reflection of yourself in him. Perhaps surprisingly to the author Cervantes himself, he has not exhausted the depths of Don Quixote. This character seems to be endlessly replicable and survivable. In exploring the relationship between fiction and reality, no character has traveled as far as Don Quixote. Don Quixote metaphorically represents an attitude towards dealing with reality, providing us with a reference for what distance and scale are respectable, noble, and, at the same time, safe when facing reality. This distance and scale are eternal human problems. We know we cannot soar like birds or crawl like reptiles. This predicament has troubled humanity for so many years, and to this day, no one has found a perfect answer. We can find many authors in the Don Quixote camp. They enjoy grand themes, have idealistic tendencies, and see reality as part of an epic, such as Hugo, Dostoevsky, and Pasternak. Pasternak paid a tremendous health and political price to write Dr. Zhivago, and in the latter part of his life, his only wish was to make this book a classic. The poet Akhmatova didn't appreciate his posture, stating that he merely enjoyed the feeling of being a martyr. See, this is something Sancho would say. Sancho Camp authors excel in dissolving and satirizing, poking at the painful spots of grand narratives. Regarding reality, they intentionally maintain a distance always with a skeptical gaze. Apart from Flaubert mentioned earlier, we can also cite Chekhov, Mark Twain, Dylan Thomas, and even Woody Allen. In Chekhov's Uncle Vanya, there is a false hero, an Italian colonel who is regularly involved in drug trafficking and extortion. The Germans imprison him, hoping he will impersonate the anti-fascist General Rovira, gathering intelligence among the prisoners. The real general has already been secretly executed by the Nazis. The colonel gradually gets into character, unable to extricate himself from the role of the general. In the end, he not only does not betray the Nazis but bravely plays the role to the end, sacrificing himself as the general, providing the prisoners resisting fascism with tremendous inspiration and confidence. How about that? Does this resemble a Don Quixote? Now, let's look at a version rewritten by Argentine writer Borges. In this version, the true protagonist of this great book is not our familiar, melancholic knight but the peasant Sancho. However, aware that he, a lover of chivalric tales, is no match for this world, when Don Quixote finds him, he quickly agrees. What concerns him is not some island but the fact that this well-read man understands the subtleties of chivalric tales better than he does. More marvelously, Don Quixote is easy to deceive and genuinely goes to battle with windmills. Sancho places himself in a humble position to safely observe this performance prepared solely for him. It's like watching a live broadcast, reliving the entire tradition of chivalric tales. This should be the most sarcastic Sancho in history. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends. Thank you.